Hello, my name is Pablo and I'm from Tenerife, Spain. Hi guys, I'm Willie and I come from Hong Kong. Louise, I'm from the UK. Hello, my name is Inga and I'm from Lithuania. Hello, my name is Inez and I'm from Portugal. Hello guys, my name is Holland and I'm from Lithuania. Okay, so in this video we are going to talk about post-colonial ethnography and how technology is used in elemental buildings. So, let's go! So, um, ethnography is used uh, in sociology uh, to study uh, all, me uh, all media cultures and it is used to um, to study media audiences and institutions. Okay. Do you know what post-colonial ethnography is? No, I do not. Do you know what post-colonial ethnography means? No. No. For post-colonial ethnography, it has to mention India. India, which is a developing country as well as a third world country, it keeps developing and catching the world's movement. For example, the political part. As the government in India apply traditional ruling in the country, it opens up the effect of post-colonial ruling on the cultural aspects of the colony as well as the influence on political issues, religions and language. As under post-colonial ethnography, there comes an opposition between people and the government. In other words, some of the people do not agree with the way that the government rules the country and its policies. Here are some case studies. The process of approaching structural functionalism has been designed across the country in relation to ethnographic experiences. Throughout the years, India's Indian society has developed its own identity, as well as India's anthropology has also developed its own concept of edification. India and its theoretical development are not precisely accumulated, thus the sequential account does not lead to a straight path to theoretical awareness. Moreover, the outlook of the colonial government attempted to split hug swinging from mainstream approaches of Hindu religion so that it could be shown as an event that was not supported by a majority of the Hindus. It was a private event done to satisfy economic <coughs> needs and to satisfy temple priests. This would thus open the way to its abolishment. So I watched a video on YouTube that was talking about post-colonial um, technologies in India and I took some information from it. So I've learned that colonies have been shaping India over 200 years, not only in a cultural and economic way, but also technological. India's development was um, invested by many uh, Western countries in engineering education, such as Soviet Union, USA and Germany, who educated highly successful Indian engineers. And uh, after India won its independence from Great Britain, it started building its nation. And from then until now, India is very friends with urban technologies. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what, I, that's what I learned from it. So in spite of having a traditional government management, India is one of not so many countries who belongs to the most developing countries group. This kind of government was influenced by the ethnography which helped them to achieve the position they have now. 
The ethnography brought a lot of new experiences and identities and they also caused a great development on areas like anthropology. All in all, we can say that colonialism really influenced the way we see the world today in post-colonial present. Thank you so much for coming for our interview. For this week's task, we decided to conduct interviews as a method to find data about friendship in social media. We chose this method, me this method, so we could simply focus on the single on a single person that we are interviewing and obtain more relevant and qualitative data. In this kind of primary research method, it is easier to get more personal answers and build a, rep a rapport with the interviewee. That is, making the interviewee believe that his or her answers are significant for our research. One of our group members was in charge of writing the questions. We decided to make a structured interview with open-ended questions, which give freedom for the interviewee to express his feelings for how long as he wanted. Hello, uh, thank you so much for coming for our interview. Uh, we have some questions about friendship in social media. Are you okay answering yeah, questions about that? Okay, so uh, have you ever made friends through social media? Um, I actually met you for social media um, on the Compass Society app. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I've made a few friends on social media, um, usually across from other countries like Korea. Uh, what do you think about the people you make uh, friends with through social media? It's quite interesting because you can like learn about their cultures, you know, learn languages. I mean, that's my main purpose for making friends online. Uh, what do you think about people that make friends through social media? This is going to be very, very awkward because people are walking around. Um, I think they must have um, a lot of time on their hands, not in a bad way, mm. and uh, they might might be very shy to make friends, um, you know, face to face. That's right. what I imagine. And uh, they must be very invested in this relationship because uh, most of the time they only meet in real life after a few years. Also, I think it's a little bit risky also. Uh, that brings me to my next question mm -hmm. is like, what factors do you think people that meet friends through social media have to do it? For example, uh, they might be bored, so they want to meet people, they... What kind of factors so what do makes them yeah, want what to? makes them want to? Like friends, social media. I guess um, maybe they have a kind of interest that is kind of as a niche, you know, that uh, they are not around people who are interested in those uh, things. So they find an online community where they're full of people who are like them. The people who we interviewed were university students because they are the ones who are more involved with the world of social media. Before the interview, we informed them that we needed to record them as a form of visual evidence and also clarify the purpose of the interview in order to avoid any ethical issues. After interviewing two people, we found out that uh, you can make friends on social media. However, people have different opinions on social media in general because the interviewees had different opinions of you different point of views and opinions on making friends using social media. According to the interview, interviewees we interviewed, they would want to meet new friends to learn more about their cultures and that they have spare time to meet new people because they are shy to meet them face to face. Also, they would meet them in person just to overcome the border between both of them. People do not share the same opinions and would use social media in different ways to make friends. When people plan to make their relationships with their friends long term or short term relies on what they are looking for a friend rather than the method they use to make one.
The topic of the week was researching space. For this week's task, each group had to go to a place in Coventry and observe people who frequented that location. After taking notes on their behavior, we were supposed to disrupt the place so we could get a reaction from them. Our group was assigned to go to Fargo Village and observe the residents. Far Gosford Street was the main route in the Middle Ages from Coventry towards Leicester and London, where the origin of Gosford came from the track that crossed the River Sherborne. During that period, craftsmen in the city formed the first of the city's finest area for trade. In the 13th century, metal workers and blacksmiths dominated the trade market, with the weavers drapers taking over in the 14th and 15th centuries. Coventry was destroyed in the November 1940 blitz. However, the street converted from a trade market to a shopping area where it was reconstructed. The space itself is located in the strategic location of the city. It is widely surrounded by local shops, university buildings and the main street which hundreds of people cross every day. Public spaces like Fargo are being looked at upon as a consumable good. We can see an increasing demand where people want to step out of their private realm and use and consume public spaces. Some scholars says that social space like this provides a platform to experience something new and introduces a feeling of discovery and adventure. It gives opportunity for the unfamiliar to mingle freely but at the same time have control of their own privacy. So Fargo, as a space is presumed, where society is being created. According to Gale, the presence of other people, activities and events comprise one of the most important qualities of public spaces altogether, with vegan festivals, Christmas workshops, art and craft markets, bookshops, Fargo forms space of wide cultural heritage representation. The ladies firstly ignored the member and continued to make flowers. After a while, they asked me our members wanted to participate as well, to which our member politely refused. Five minutes later, the person from our group decided that it was time to leave, so she bid her goodbye. As we were leaving the entire room, we spot a young man leaning on his car. We made ourselves unnoticed it and sent one of us to approach the man and disturb him. The hapless victim glanced at our disturber and asked if he, she was okay, to which she replied passively. Awkward silence surrounded them so the man decided to make like conversation with the disturber. Eventually, the conversation died and that was our member's clue to leave. She dismissed herself and started to look around, looking for the next target. From the moment on, her disruptions were minimal, such as getting in someone's way and dancing from side to side with them, invading people's personal space as they talk on the phone, etc. As a public space, Fargo is designed as an outdoor, but still partly closed and isolated space. We can see that from spacing of street lights, arrangement of street furniture, design of landscape, pattern of pathway and zoned activity space. The reaction from people who worked at Fargo Village was quite surprising because we were not expecting them to be so comfortable with a stranger who sat next to them and invaded their personal space. This can tell us that people in this space were used to people walking in and out, touching and exploring everything they see. Whereas, the reaction from people visiting the space temporarily or new to Fargo Village was far more confused and slightly disoriented. Some started to make conversation and others ignored the disturber's presence.
This week's topic is researching digital. Digital describes electronic technology that generates, stores, and processes data. It can also be described as a representation of quantity data by a two-digit binary code. So our group picked several research methods uh, to research experiences of engaging with digital media such as blogging and interviewing. Drawing on our knowledge of other research methods discussed in the lecture and our readings, we have researched digital media usage amongst Coventry University students and more specifically, digital media ethics. But first, what is digital ethics? Digital ethics is the study of how to manage oneself ethically, professionally and in a clinically sound manner via online and digital mediums. In simple words, digital ethics teaches people how to behave when using digital media. We had to find out how Coventry University students apply digital ethics while studying. Before interviewing students, we looked up for some general examples of how digital ethics is being adopted to different situations and platforms. While doing that, we reached the discussion when unethical media usage becomes illegal. Like ethics, digital media is also challenging to conceptually define. Many scholars have struggled and debated the scope of digital media. Some scholars define digital media by platforms, such as Google, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Amazon, and others. Other scholarship defines digital media by the technology that supports it. That includes digital video, imagery, games, web pages, social media, databases, MP3s, audio, etc. When talking about digital ethics, we definitely have to mention copyright. Copyright is the right to control the production and selling of books, movies, pictures and music. Almost everyone knows that it is a violation of law to copy other people's works of authorship without the owner's permission or a valid fair use exemption. You may have also heard about plagiarism, a thing which every student faces. It is defined as the use of another's information, language or writing when done without proper acknowledgement of the original source. However, the critical element of this is the final part. The one thing that ties all plagiarism together is going beyond merely duplicating the work but also not crediting the source and thus taking the material for yourself. In this way, author's work loses its value. So now let's move on with examples we found when doing the research. In 2015, Yelp, a mobile app which published crowdsourced reviews, faced an ethics crisis after users learned that the company accepted money from companies in exchange for scrubbing or removing bad reviews from their profile. Digital technology influences socio-economic structures and confers power and competitive edge on those who design applications. We have the questions we have are are you aware of what digital ethics is if not we will explain when do you think public trust is violated by digital media platforms <coughs> as you might know all your data is tracked analyzed and kept by companies and website owners how can that impact you as a Coventry University student how often do you use online Moodle and do you think your data is safe and your privacy can be kept with Moodle? And why so? From the online interviews we did, we understood that some university students were not familiar with the term digital ethics. Therefore, we gave them a definition based in our readings. Students showed awareness for the fact that their data can be saved and tracked by companies and website owners. They claimed, however, that even if their privacy was violated by digital media platforms, they could not prevent it. As a Coventry University student, our interviewees revealed that they use the university's Moodle very often to check assignments, lecture PowerPoints, checking email, etc. They also mentioned that Moodle is a safe place which protects 
people's personal data without intriguing their privacy. Conclusion Achieving effective learning via digital media continues to be a major concern in contemporary education. We really enjoy this research method because it was interesting to conduct. Last task we have been given on this project is to discuss about distinctive and unique category of sensory feelings based on national, ethnic and local contexts. But first, what does the sensory mean? Sensory, relating to sensation or the physical senses transmitted or perceived by the senses. Hearing, touch, smell, taste. And sight. Lately, there have been lots of advancements in sensory technology and according to The Guardian, increasingly high-tech world of sensory marketing is becoming big business for brands. It's designed to appeal to all of the human senses, to engage emotions and thereby influence purchasing behavior. What we wanted to do as a group was to use blindfolded interview method and test on specific smells to find out what people felt. This week we are researching sensory and uh, we chose a sense that it smells. So we're going to um, give people different types of incense so they can feel the smell and then tell, the, tell us if it brings memories or it affects them in any way. People say that the visual sense is the most important sense, that if people lose it, it will be hard to adapt. Studies we made show that the smell sense is equally, if not more important, than the visual sense. Smell is strongly related to mood, behavior and memory. Researchers made by Rockefeller University of New York states that we can only remember 2% of what we hear, 5% of what we see, and 35% of what we smell. Incense is a type of smell we chose for our research. We chose it as a way of introducing something from the rabbit culture and because it's a scent that people are not familiar with. Incense is a Middle Eastern perfume scent which originated from India. Arabs use incense to welcome guests at home as a sign of hospitality, wedding celebrations and other special occasions. Incense is also used as a treatment of pains, diseases and to treat infections and wounds. For our investigation, we decided to use the most common incense in Kuwait, which are Oud, Amber, Musk, Jasmine. Before we interviewed the interviewees, we all agreed that the scents were pleasant. Although the interviewees had different answers, it is clear that they all shared a similar idea towards the scent in general. The most common compounds are Oud, Amber, Musk, Jasmine, Roses and Saffron. It's an sensory and most particularly smell. So we wanted to smell some incense from Kauai. Yeah. Okay. And then you can tell us if you feel something, if it reminds you of something, the smells. Okay. Bring them on. How do you feel about the smell? Reminds me of an hospital. Okay. Um, can you see something? Mm, obviously not. Wait. Imagination. Can you imagine a place from the smell? Yeah. What? what uh, when you smell this? What can you imagine you yeah. a location? An hospital. Like the, do you know like the rooms, the doctor room? Yeah. It reminds me of the doctor room. Okay. Is it pleasant or no? So ready. You can hold my hand. We 
many civilians do you see place? Can you find that? <laughs> okay. I'm recording all this. Yeah. It's a magic trick. It smells does in different scents, incense, and you have to just answer the questions I ask while you smell it. Okay. <laughs> Bring in the scent. <laughs> Don't spray. I did it all. Do you like it? I did it all. Candle. It smells like candle. Do you, is it pleasant or how do you feel with this smell? Because it was closer to your nose, probably. Does it remind you of something? No. No? Where would you sing? Uh, where, where would you smell this? Candle shop. The candle shop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me actually of a location. But I've been uh, into stores that sell like African uh, mm -hmm. slash Asian products, mm -hmm. and it that smell kind of reminds me of that. Okay, so yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. From this experiment, we learn more about ethnic differences in sensory perception. In a world where digital devices dominate, engaging consumers by stimulating their senses beyond purely visual, audio, or even scent, advertising unconsciously has the potential to be incredibly powerful. Generally, our group really enjoyed researching sensory a scientific discipline that applies principles of experimental design and statistical analysis to the use of all human senses.